Well, uh, today on the laboratory is going to be slightly different. We're not going to be fixing anything. More, I'm going to be destroying something. <laughs> so, this is a old Cricut expression machine. Uh, they're no longer supported, apparently. I got this one at the G Dub or the Goodwill. Only it was twenty-five dollars, and I got twenty percent off. So it makes like twenty bucks. To me, it was worth it mainly for the power supply. There's a lot of people out there use the Cricut machines. They all use the 18 volt power supplies, and they're about 12, 13 bucks on Amazon generally. So I'm like, yeah. Plus, I can use spare parts out of this thing. So I just plugged it in and I'll open it up. And you can see it does light up. Copyright 2006. And then it turns right back off. So, I mean, mainly because it probably doesn't have a card in here or it's broke. One of the two. It was at a Goodwill. They had about 20 of these things sitting there. I have no idea. This was the only one for the same price that had a power supply, which to me was the most important thing. As I have as myself, I have a Cricut machine. I have the Explorer Air 2, and I got it for like 20 bucks at Goodwill, but it was missing the power supply. <laughs> so I had to go buy a separate one. So, but what I've been told, not necessarily from anybody specifically, but just from doing research in general uh, from different internet websites, is that even though they're different machines, the internals are very similar, especially the part that drives the cutter. And looking up at different forums and being part of different forums and dealing with different uh, cricket modifications and so on and so forth, the motor that drives this can overheat and burn out. Possible. I don't know. I haven't had that problem with mine. Uh, my $20 machine has been working great for over a year. So I want to take this thing apart and see what we can scavenge for pieces. Also, if you happen to have this and it somehow still works, uh, maybe this will help you figure out how to open it and get to your sensitive components. Also, these all light up, so there might be some salvageable parts inside the LEDs. I'm not too concerned about the monitor, but I can keep it for something. Um, the knobs, they're still crisp with the clicking and the engaging. So there might be some gears in here that can be salvaged. Uh, that's the reason why we're the Random Junk Channel, because I take random junk and I reuse it. So I already unplugged it from the wall socket and turning this thing upside down. We have a whole bunch of screw holes. I want to see if there's any screws inside these caps. a circuit board in there so if you need feet he comes with little rubber feet that might be good replacements so look at the bottom you can see I got a half a dozen screws we got one here five there and then there's two here also depending on how this is done this is the same size port that's used on most like Lemax and other products so you might be able to salvage that depending on how it's attached to the actual unit so but when a lot of people ask me where I get my parts from um, till more recently this is where I would get my parts from I would literally scavenge electronics uh, mostly radios CD players because the gears the belts and even the motor are very common hobby motors and used in a lot of different things whether they be animated houses or um, stereo equipment so on and so forth so this is basically a taste into what I do to try and find your parts to repair other things. Now I'm not going to tell you to go buy a $20 Cricut machine 
nor am I going to tell you to go buy anything that you don't want to. But I'm going to let you know that if you have something lying around, before you toss it, see if you can uh, dismantle it and salvage anything. But anything that takes power, make sure that you disconnect the power source so you don't, uh, well, fry yourself. So, let's see, we got some clips here that holds on some power wires. So there's a pair of pliers to pull it out while I pull back the lock. too concerned about where they go, mainly because I'm not putting this thing back together. But if you're opening yours to try and service it, which I know the manufacturers always recommend against, um, you might want to take a picture and see. So That's the one I took out. And there's your circuit board. And this has, that's a little speaker. We got a nice set of uh, high power resistors, which may come in handy for a project. Uh, looks like we have some uh, regulators, power regulators, a bank of them. Uh, some basic capacitors. And yeah, this is soldered to the board. That's the power port. So it's got uh, th two, three pads of solder, back, side, and one in the front center. So if you unscrew this circuit board, you could technically remove that and use that as another replacement piece. So, and if you have something that needs ribbon cable, it has ribbon cables. Let's uh, get this thing out of the way since we don't need the bottom anymore. And uh, we'll Carter into here. We have a nice belt right here. It's a tooth belt. So that means the inside of the belt is ribbed to match the teeth on the the pulleys. So here's the pan. We have another, um, most likely it's a voltage regulator. And it is using this big metal plate as a heat sink. So this one gets really hot. And we got some springs. Might come in handy for stuff too. You never know. So now let's see what it's going to take to get the sides off. like under this pink trim there might be some screws and the pink trim I can see the clips on the inside so I'll pop it off so let's see if I can get to these screws second screwdriver to hold it open. Hopefully enough that I can get this first screwdriver back into it. Like so This may not be the correct way to pop this off. But there we go. We got one, two, three, four screws. Looks like it holds the end on. Just 
so far everything is just the number two Phillips. I'd recommend one that has a decently long shaft. That way you can get into some of these deeper holes. As far as popping this off, um, one of them did break. So if you're trying to fix this, just be careful because uh, it could also be this is just old and brittle since it is around early 2000s. So here's the side. And here's the belt that has the teeth with the, the drive pulley. Here's the motor right here. This is the shaft that moves back and forth down here, which is your paper or matte scroller. And this belt's in good shape. I don't know if it's the same that they currently use on the belts. And this is, these are the potentiometers for these wheels right here with the ribbon cable. And then this is the idler pulley for the other motor on the other end that moves the cutter back and forth. So let's uh, open that one. Again, you can see these little tabs sticking through on the inside. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna pry up the corner and then see if I can get it to pop. So the side with the power button on this model is a side that has the motor that I've heard is the more common one to fail. Um, whether or not that's 100% true, I don't know. I've never had a failure. Only once has my system ever locked up, and I just turned the power off and turned it back on and I reset it. I think it locked up because of transmission failure between my computer and the unit. That one I got off them breaking any tabs. I'm already getting better at this. Same thing, we got four screws. And these screws are a decent sized screw for a lot of hobbies, so if you want to keep some, if you're taking one of these apart for you know, parts, then these are very similar in size to a lot of other hobby projects, especially Mr. Christmas as an example, that may require a screw. All right, so on this side, here is the motor, and this thing's a biggie, look at that. My square base. Big power port, multiple wires, and here's the drive right there. Again, this is another stepped tooth belt. If this belt is big enough, there are some Lemax yards, front yards, that use belts that wear out. Stuff like this, which has a large belt, especially because it's not only long, it's wide, you can possibly be re repurposed. So. That's another reason why stuff like this that's outdated or non-functional also take apart for parts because there's possibly a way to modify items to benefit another thing that's broken. So, all right. So now I want to try and separate this mechanism, the big metal piece with the two motors, uh, from the top so I can get to the juicy electronics that are sitting underneath this, this top piece right here. And there are no screws in the top. I can see there's a gap right here and I can see the tabs where this is locked into place by tension because there's also a seam right here, right here, so it looks like there's a chance that this can either be pried out or unscrewed to leave or lead tension on these corners. So let's uh, take a look. This also gives you an idea how I work on things that I've never taken apart before. I just examine the placement of the screws and the mounts and look at things like um, 
Okay, this screw and these two screws are screwed into this plate here, which is the bottom. Uh, this screw, being recessed into a hole, is doing absolutely nothing to hold this structure in. It's used for something inside here, inside the door mechanism. Uh, these screws just hold in the wheel, this wheel right here. So when I tell you that you should look at your piece if you're going to try and open it, this gives you an idea how to examine and look for things, clues, that what will or won't work in disassembly. Which is why I'll try to recap a lot of them to try and help you out. Uh, because this is how I taught myself a long time ago. I just sat there and examined what I was doing. And then uh, over time I could start to identify seams and spaces and I'm not always right. I'm not going to lie and say I'm perfect. But it helps give you an idea what to do. So I'm all for having you do your own thing. Especially if it's broken. It's really hard to make it more broken unless you physically shatter the unit. screw isn't quite straight with the screwdriver because the motor is in the way, but I got it. Probably be faster if I used an electric screwdriver. There's a lot of screws. Let's do that. Let's try and speed up this process a little bit. And there is a screw underneath the motor, I can see, so we're going to take out the motor. Here's a, uh, a button. I'm assuming this button is used as the uh, cutter. Comes all the way over, it probably hits this button and is a disconnector, so it's more of like a motion stop button. Uh, this is a herky little motor, I'll tell you that. It's a moon stepping motor, type 17 HD. It is a herky little guy. It's actually pretty stout for uh, its size. Quite impressive. I don't know if it's true that it's an interchangeable motor. I don't even know what voltage it runs at. Uh, I'm assuming it's 18 volts or less. But this might be something usable in the future. Like I said I scavenge parts all the con all the time. So you got another ribbon cable. Most likely with the ribbon cables like this I don't use much. I usually recycle them. Cables like this, where they're individual wires, if you need short sections of decent quality wire, you can cut the ends off and use it, um, especially because they're color coded. So if you're doing a multiple wire repair, you got multiple colored wires. So underneath the motor, we got two screws right there. And I think these two screws are giving me the, uh, I wasn't supposed to slide out of my hand, but giving me the lack of adjustment and they're much longer 
now. Let's all this big metal plate pop off now. Yes and no, it did actually separate, but it is held in with this bearing. So I'm gonna see if I can slide it off this bearing. There we go. And of course the belt's holding it in because they looped the belt through here, which I don't understand how they were able to do that since there's no, there's no break in this metal. Might be able to figure it out once we take it more apart. Maybe it's a two-piece belt. So, this side's now separated. And now we're gonna go to the other side and do it again. And probably didn't see how I did it before. I'm gonna take a screwdriver and then if you roll the belt, turn the belt and the pulley to get it to where it can lift over the shoulder. You can usually walk the belt off. <sighs> like so. That one's a little bit stiffer on the other side. And then this side has this tensioning springs, kind of like on a car. I don't think you can see this thing move uh, to keep your belt tensioned. metal plate on the bottom. There's a hole right here so you can get in here with the screwdriver and unscrew the screw that's right here which is going to separate this motor. This motor is now hanging. It's the same type of motor. It is a moon stepping motor type 470, type 47HD. Here's the guide bar, the feed bar with the rubber, or I think they're silicone actually, rollers to grab your mat. Just set it off to the side. This pulley has an Allen screw right here that you can use to remove this shaft from this plate. I'm just going to remove the screws on the side. It's probably loud. That is why the belt goes through. It's not a complete belt. It uses a, a keyhole 
and it attaches to the inside. So it's not an oval belt or a continuous belt, it is a belt that is connected on one end and the other, and it moves this plate, this plate right here, back and forth. So. So the keyhole is actually attached to the mechanism on the inside. I'm going to remove the plate that actually the motor rides back and forth on. Let me remove the motor wire assembly. Maybe. Here is the cutting head. There's a little knife that came with it. And this is pulled back and forth using this belt right here. And these uh, lock loops just connect like that, so it pulls it. I'm trying to see what's inside here should just be the little motor that moves it up and down. So let's take a look. The dissection of an old cricket machine. So this is a uh, it's a it's basically a magnetic coil and when it engages it pulls it down. I don't know if you can see that. Um, it's basically a contactor, so sends its signal and then click, and then let's go with the signal, click, kind of like an electromagnet, but since I have it open, let's, uh, let's remove the cutting implement, since it's right there, you can see it sticking out, so I don't stab myself, because don't feel like bleeding all over this thing. So this could have uses in the future for something that if I needed a metal a contactor to move something a short distance. Now I am kind of surprised that this doesn't have a complete loop belt. A lot of the printers I take apart the ones that have the, the teeth on the belt, or the belts that uh, grip, they're complete circles, while this one was just using it on a mount to push and pull. So, I wasn't expecting that, but I've never opened one before. And, this, just double back taped on. These, you have to pull the cap up, if you saw that, and then it pops right out. Very common on computers. So if you ever take your laptop apart or something to change the battery or add RAM, you'll have this style ribbon cable where you have to relieve the tension. This side has it too right there. So we have another ribbon cable that goes into the top circuitry. And I see... I don't know, six screws. This might be too big. Yeah, it's too big of a bit. I need a smaller screwdriver. So, if my Cricut Air ever fails, one of the motors, 
I'll look up what motor it takes and see if it's the same one that was in here. If it was, then I already got the motors. Again, it's a short section of a uh, heavier gauge wire. Whether or not you need these clips is up to you, but if you need wire and you scavenge something like this, you can use this because it is a decent gauge. It's uh, good for LEDs or replacing motor wire, especially because a lot of animated houses, since that's the majority what I take apart and repair, they use very, very thin wires. Ribbon cable, stuff like this, I never really keep. I don't keep ribbon cable for the most part because it's not the highest quality wire to work with. So since I relieve tension, I'm going to see if I can get this to pop out. And the front's out. So I'm get the back. Probably missing a screw somewhere. Let's take a look. Not that it matters too much. So, apparently, this whole panel, there's a lock right here what the serrated piece is. So I'm going to push it out and see if it will pop the panel up. This is why my bench is so messy. So, almost. There we go. I have the lock completely up. And... And that's how that comes out. So, there's some notches right here, as you can see. And we got the fingers right here. And then this is a slide lock. So you don't have to take those screws out unless you want to get inside this. That slide lock was covering this last screw. So let's see what's inside. Actually, that slide lock, now that I have it out, this plate was also covering some screws. And this plate, and this plate. <laughs> so, so it looks like there's 10 screws. You probably never have to open this. I'm only opening this to see if any of those lights are scavengeable. I have a funny feeling they're probably soldered to the circuit board. So here's the circuit board. I got a capacitor, two, four, five capacitors, another ribbon cable, a relay. And this is a 10 amp, 120 volt uh, relay, but it's rated for 18 volts DC as well. Yeah. And the lights are all on the board. So, if you've never seen this kind of circuit board, these little pads, which are the buttons, contact the two pads next to each other to send the signal. That's why there's nothing here. Um, but these little dots right here are the LEDs. So you can heat them up with air, right there, right there, and desolder them. I probably won't, because surface mount LEDs are kind of a pain, to say it nicely. Uh, this ribbon cable is the monitor. The capacitors might be salvageable, as far as they, they seem to be a decent quality. I can look up this chip. It's probably another regulator to regulate the voltage inside here. But what I do notice is uh, something got in here. You might be able to see this white. 
It's um, it's almost like grease. It's it's slimy. So I'm wondering if something got spilled that dripped inside this pad and then oozed out around the edges. Or if maybe this was stored upside down and there might be grease on the mechanism somewhere in this pile of parts and it got onto the circuitry. Because I don't see it on here, just this, this, and here. Unless it's old flux that's just corroded from when they soldered it together. So, why it doesn't stay on is beyond me. It could have been this, this stuff causing a problem, a short. It could have a problem in one of these chips that it has on the board. Or, um, or because it's so old it's just done. Maybe one of these discrete components, like one of these capacitors, or these smaller ones here, these are capacitors. We have some uh, diodes and resistors. Maybe one of these has popped. Uh, maybe it's detecting one of the motors is shorted out and it's a safety feature. I'm not quite sure, but I knew it didn't work when I picked it up at the Goodwill. I plugged it into their test station and I did not buy it to repair it. I bought it specifically to scavenge pieces out of it. Because things like this, um, that could, it's a fully intact cutting piece with, it looks like it's got the 30 degree blade. Now, if I want to make some of my money back, I could put this on eBay for five bucks and sell it. Because um, it will not work in the, the modern Cricut Air 2 Explorer uh, Air 2. So, the potentiometers that are attached to these wheels might come in handy as replacement volume knobs for different things. I have to check the resistances on them because when you're using them for volume as an example, it goes by the resistance range of the potentiometer. So there's some more potential parts here. Let's uh, take this out. So here's the, the board and there's the wheels. They just, if you see the bar fits inside like so. And then there's your, this one's got an arc on it. It doesn't spin freely in a complete circle. And same with this. So. any labeling just says this is your speed control and this one is pressure so they are just potentiometers they might still be good and they're salvageable they're held on with these nuts and then just remove the three solder pads here and here with a solder gun an iron solder gun and a solder sucker, whether you use a wick or an actual sucker. And then you could have yourself a couple of potentiometers, which might be used for other projects. So let's take this one off. Same thing. Pull it off the board. This one says it's a V2 encoder. This one's a little more fancy. It has capacitors and resistors right here because this one spins in a circle. It doesn't have a stop. You can tell by the bottom and there's no cap. There's nothing in there to stop it from rotating in either direction. So this one with the encoder chips, it determines what it's going to do which is the size, so it probably sends a signal to this and tells you the width of your material. But this is something that's more often used on volume knobs. You ever have a knob like on your radio? You can spin the knob 100, 
80 times if you wanted and it just spins in a circle so this is a different type of potentiometer which also has its uses but again you got to test the resistance levels across the pins which are these three pins right here same thing it's got a nut take it off so i will desolder these and stick them in my kits i have over there of random parts for random repairs So, anybody need a shell? That's pretty much it on the inside. We still have a steel bar right here, which is apparently the guide bar, um, where it has the feed ramp. It's got the shiny, I don't know if you can see it. It's uh, got a, looks like a, probably a piece of nylon for slickness. It is bowed. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. I know when it's in the plastic, it's straight but you can see it is bowed. Uh, like I said, you can get some springs out of here. Um, we got a large gear right there. Right there. That I'll probably take that out to keep that gear because some of these, uh, especially Mr. Christmas, they like to use large gears. And if there's a large gear that matches, there we go, I got a gear out of it. My biggest thing was um, getting these stepper motors out because these are big herky suckers. And they sound good, meaning that when I rotate them, they don't feel crunchy. Um, I got myself a momentary push button switch, some belt material, a round belt, and then the uh, long hook belt. And I got some wire I'll probably keep, this stuff. Again, I'm not get rid of this, so I recycle it. Uh, a lot of recyclers take wire. Out here they do. I don't know where you all are if they do or don't. Like I said, I'm probably not going to keep the monitor. We don't really need the monitor or the plastic housings. Um, I'll look up the... Well, I can look real quick. I might look up the chip and see which chip it is. I might keep these capacitors just to have some small ones. And if I can, I'll take the relay. Because these little relays come in handy for odd projects, especially when I work on cars that have uh, remotes that are digital or analog. Uh, they use these itty bitty relays, uh, especially on some of the fan cars I do for comic cons and filming. Um, a lot of the small controllers use those little relays, which I have a half a dozen of them left. So I'll add another one and I can test it by setting signal to it and see if it clicks on and off. So. Uh, also, if you recycle or reuse, uh, it's a pretty sturdy piece of aluminum. Just unscrew that and you can use it for something. It's a piece of track. Uh, or you can recycle it. Or you can just throw it in the garbage, whatever you prefer. So, other than the plastic housing and the actual circuit board here, most of this is actually reusable and I probably will reuse it. Even stuff like this, these plates, a lot of people go, oh, it's garbage, I have no use for it. Well, when I build custom stuff for cars, especially when I need to make brackets, stuff like this comes in handy because I can mount it using the big holes and then screw on what I need into the holes that already have a boss. Uh, so stuff like this will go into my scrap metal pile and you'll be surprised how much stuff you can reuse from other things. And stuff like this might come in handy if I need to mount uh, removable relays or switches to a firewall of a car on the inside. Instead of having the plate where I screw it directly to the firewall, I screw this to the plate and then screw this to the firewall. So I don't have to drill new holes every time or risk, risk wearing out the holes. So even these flat pieces of metal come in handy. Uh, I once built a relay bank for a uh, replica uh, kit car, kit being 1984 Knight Rider. And I took a piece of aluminum like this, it was slightly wider, and it had the L's on the ends, and I was able to screw this into the fender, or above the fender, and then I mounted my relay bank on top to make it look pretty, because it was a nice shiny piece of aluminum. And then after I mounted all the relays, I uh, drilled a couple of holes, like this one already has one for the screw for that, uh, voltage regulator, put a standoff on it and covered it in clear acrylic. So one, you couldn't touch the wires 
too. It made it look very clean when you popped the hood because it was uh, almost an identical replica of how they actually did the scanner controller from the 1980s when the series was out. So stuff like this comes in handy. But it depends on what you all do with your projects, whether you need stuff like this or roller guides. You know, do you need a magnetic coil to move something? So, but this is just to show you that you can scavenge parts from virtually everything to try and fix other things. Uh, you know, it's reuse, recycle, and replace. So, the housing, that's going to go away. Uh, this green circuit board, once I remove the components I want, it's going to go away. And the rest of this stuff will be stored. And then this gray ribbon cable is going to uh, get recycled. I go about once every three months and recycle wire because my company goes through tons of wire and we recycle the scrap to offset the cost later on down the road. Uh, it helps keep our prices a little bit lower than other people since we recycle the stuff and get paid for it so then we can lower the cost of other things. And then these springs, um, some electronics especially if it has a motor, uses these springs for dampening. That's why those two springs were screwed on. It was their dampening springs. You can also use them where you set a screw and the spring adds tension like a lock washer, but allows you to adjust the depth of the screw and keeps tension on it using a spring. So springs like this come in handy as well. Again, it depends on what you do and what you need it for, but I have a bucket of miscellaneous springs and there are times when I mount stuff that's somewhat sensitive inside of a car, as an example, because most of my other job is making custom stuff for cars. If I can't have the vibration transmit through the components, I will mount it on springs to act as many shock absorbers. That's just an old school technique. A lot of new stuff uses rubber or silicone pads, like in your Walkman or your old Discman, if you even remember those, because nobody uses them anymore. Uh, your car CD player, if you still have one that has one, uh, they have these silicone bungs that the tray bounces on. So when you hit a bump, your CD doesn't skip every time. So the other way was to use springs. And I still use the old school way just because it's easier. It's, it's faster for me. So, But this was an old Cricut Expressions. Torn apart, stripped down in less than an hour with the parts I can salvage, parts that I can't. And yeah, you might see one of these pieces used in a future video to repair something. Uh, if not, they will go into my buckets of miscellaneous parts and maybe get used for something else. So wasn't the most exciting. It wasn't really a repair video. Like I said, it was more of a tear down, dismantle, discuss. And if you have a Cricut, this one, and you need to get in there and try and replace this motor because the motors are purchasable. I've seen them on many different websites. Um, you can kind of see how to dismantle this thing. Got to be careful in the plastics, but you may not have to take all of that off to get what to whatever you need to do to service your Cricut. I know Cricut itself, if you contact them, they tell you not to service it. Uh, if it's under warranty, sure, don't service it. That's what you have a warranty for. It's out of warranty, it's yours. Do what you want. That is the way I look at things. And I'd rather see somebody take something like this and strip it for parts than throw away the whole thing, knowing that stuff like this is reusable or recyclable. Components on the circuit boards are reusable or recyclable. The metal pieces can be recycled and reused. This plastic housing, most likely, no. A lot of places will not recycle plastics like this because they can't re-break them down. So this, unfortunately, would have to go into garbage. But this shell in the garbage is better than all of this aluminum, which is recyclable. And if you have enough of it, they'll give you money for it. Especially because like this piece is really heavy. It's structural aluminum. Same with this track, structural aluminum. Or you might know a tinkerer that needs something like this. You never know. I mean, this is a nice track. Heck, it's got grooves in here. Maybe you could put some lighting in here and put a acrylic plaque in here. Maybe I'll try that. Um, and I could use my Cricut to etch a piece of acrylic that I could slide into this groove and make like a little random junk plaque in honor of Cricut. So there's a number of things that you can do if you use your imagination. 
Uh, heck, if you build little dioramas, here's an aluminum bridge. Make some standoffs that you can glue on the bottom or screw in. Paint this black, put a line on it, get some little miniature cars. You know, it's endless. Use your imagination. That's what I do. I look at something and say, well, it's broken, but maybe there's something else I can do with it. So, again, hopefully uh, it wasn't a big bore for y'all if you watched the whole thing. Um, it does have some reusable bits. It has some nice bearings that can be reused for stuff. You got shafts and bars. I mean, here, cut this into pieces and glue them onto the bottom, and then you can have steel uh, uprights for your, your overpass or your bridge. So, um, you can use the springs. Like I said, there's a tensioner takes up the slack and the jerkiness in the motor. That's what I use the springs for. So there's a lot of stuff on here that can be reused and recycled. And then you have nice pulleys with set screws for the gears. And you have another gear right here that's still pressed in, which on this one would be this hole right there. So, you know, it is what it is. So, anyhow. We'll get back to the repair videos once I clear off my bench and find a home for all these pieces because my drawers, unfortunately, are too small for stuff like this. <laughs> so, uh, or, hey, speaking of that sign, because I'm actually considering this since I thought it was a pretty good idea. Uh, if you have a sandblaster, you use the Cricut to make a pattern and then use a sandblaster to etch it or buy etching chemical. I've done that before for a display where I use the Cricut to make my pattern and then I used a glass etcher to etch the glass for a display case. So, and this would be a kind of a cool little sign you could stick on your desk that stands up on its edge that says, you know, boss or go away, I'm busy. <laughs> you could put a battery pack in here, uh, since especially if you buy the Max tabletop pieces or even Department 56, they come with battery packs that hold double A's or C's. You could just double back tape it onto the back, which would, if you have it the same height would give you more stability and um you know turn it on before you can make it where it runs off of a an ac adapter which if you wanted to do that you know this bottom circuitry has a adapter port that you can desolder and resolder so so you might see this in the future so anyway we're pushing an hour so hopefully you enjoyed hopefully it gave you some ideas hopefully it wasn't a horrible video that you all think was a useless and a waste of time uh, but there you go. That is the inside of a Cricut. That's how I dismantle electronics to scavenge the parts I need, want, or I'm going to reuse. And hopefully that gives you ideas for things you have lying around your house that are broken that maybe you don't want to throw away because there's something that might be salvageable. So, until the next time, keep junking. Thank you.